Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Ron, for that very nice introduction and a nice, light-hearted bit uh, to start us off. So, yes, um, it's lovely to be here in Sydney. I'm going to talk about this title here, and we're going to deconstruct it as we go along. So you'll see it several more times. So, first of all, big thank you to the organisers. First of all, of course, for inviting me to do this talk for Wendy and Adrian and, and colleagues, but also for setting up such an innovative conference with all sorts of new ideas about how we should listen to people's research and respond to it that's working really well, maybe except for the keynotes, but that's not yet for me to say. <laughs> and uh, also for such a wonderful setting. Can't imagine a better setting, really. So thank you, Wendy and Adrian. This is the little plan, uh, deconstructing the title. First of all, I'm going to talk about the walk part of the title, uh, that walking might be near perfect exercise, that walking levels around the world are maybe dropping, that there's a pandemic of inactivity. Second, I'm going to talk about the persuade part of the title, that behaviour change theories and techniques might help us. And third, I'm going to talk about the some people part of the title, uh, particularly where are the men in walking studies and can we walk fast enough to avoid the grim re reaper for older adults. We'll have some conclusions and discussion points uh, and I have a modest goal. My goal is that each of you take away one new thought from this uh, presentation this morning and looking out at this audience I think that is even a challenge for that modest goal to happen. So if that happens, I'll be very happy and you can tell me afterwards what your one new thought was. So first of all, a little bit about where I'm from. The University of Edinburgh is in Edinburgh, of course, and Edinburgh is the capital city of Scotland, uh, which is not part of Britain. <laughs> well, it is. It is part of Britain. But when Scotland play, we play against England not Britain, that would be us playing against ourselves. So, it was Scot Scotland beating England was that thing. <laughs> so, uh, Edinburgh is the capital city of Scotland, a beautiful city. The University of Edinburgh is an ancient university. Lots of old buildings and beautiful green spaces for students and staff to walk through. It also has some modern buildings. This is actually the building that I work in with lots of lovely staircases. And yes, I managed to find myself in the kitchen of the hotel going down the staircases uh, here in Sydney. Uh, and of course, uh, we've got lots of lecture theatres like this one um, where students sit and learn. And I have a new elephant in the room to persuade you about. And that is, here we are at the Physical Activity Conference but we spend a lot of our time sitting down and education in general, higher education, conferences, primary school education, we all need to consider is sitting the best way to learn about something? Um, it contains us in a place, but maybe that's not just the best way. And so, every so often during this presentation, I'm going to ask you to stand up and discuss a couple of things. Somewhere during the walk part of the title and somewhere during the some people bit, I'll ask you to discuss something with your neighbour and if you want to, you can stand up to do that because you know how bad that sitting down is. So on to the walk part. There are many good reasons to focus on walking. Perhaps the best is what Jerry Morris said in 1997 in quite a seminal review about the health benefits of walking, that walking is the nearest activity to perfect exercise. So starting from there, we add benefits all along. It's free, no equipment needed, it's accessible to almost everyone, it's safe, very low risk of injury, it's a popular activity, it's social, you can incorporate that into your daily life with small bouts, it has proven physiological and psychological benefits, it's a very good start point for the inactive and it can build self-efficacy for other physical activities that people might move on from. And I think you could all add another three or four points to that. And I've already noticed some very nice posters this morning from Australian uh, Heart Foundation, which start with walking in the title, which uh, speaks to this as well. However, walking distances are decreasing. 
Does the Scottish data know? In which we can see, yes, I've got the right thing. Average distance walked per person per year uh, on vertical, years passing along the horizontal, and we can see a loss over a decade of 73 miles per person per year being walked in Scotland. Some very good colleagues, Bueller and Pucher, beautifully wrote a recent article in Transport News about the levels of walking and cycling around the world. Some of you may also be interested in cycling, so those are the orange parts, but we are focusing on the blue parts. Now, look at Netherlands, doing brilliantly with their share of uh, walking and cycling for daily trips. Look at the other end. And around about 10% only in USA, <coughs> Australia, Canada, Ireland. Low levels. And somewhere in the middle here are most of the other countries that have this kind of statistic available. Around about 20% of the trips for walking. And you can see the countries here and perhaps find your own. Even more worrying that these rates are decreasing over time also. So here, if we go to the right hand side of the graph, we've got Germany from 75 to 2008. Rates of walking and cycling dropping. In the UK, dropping extremely sharply for us. In France, dropping extremely sharply. Netherlands, I, I think this m must be something to do with Phil and Van Merkel and myself, but it's managing to be stable there, and he'll be able to tell us more about that. Germany dropping. And unfortunately for you folks from the States, the authors report that this is more likely to be a recording error than a real increase. <laughs> But one thing I'd like to notice here is Denmark's rates are dropping, even for cycling. And this country is often held up to have the best infrastructure possible for walking and cycling. So, something's going on. We need some interventions. Um, you've heard many times about the Lancet series, this conference already. But the word pandemic's now being used. The last time pandemic was used, it was about bird flu. People took that pretty seriously. The next pandemic is inactivity, and I hope that's taken as seriously. So reductions in these walking uh, trips and journeys and miles per year that we've seen are part of that story of the pandemic of inactivity. So what interventions should we choose? Again, we've got very good advice from GAPA about the investments that work, and there are seven of them that you will have seen and heard about and you've got some information in your chair about it as well. So we've got good guidance now about what settings to work in. Uh, but I'm interested in what mode to take, and that's where I think walking has a key role. And what about the environment? Well, of course, it's very, very important. Um, but what I'm wanting to point out here is something that I learned from Billy Giles Corty, and thank you, Billy for letting me use this slide, about the role both of the environment and about our attitude to walking. So this is the prevalence of walking um, at the rate of public health guidance, more than 150 minutes a week, by the joint influence of individual and environmental factors. Large study that, that Billy undertook here in Australia. So on one axis here, we have how supportive the environment is, going from low to high. And on the other axis here, we've got people's attitude towards walking, going from low to high. And of course, the first contrast you want to see is that the people, uh, the highest percentage uh, are achieving the minimum recommendations are here, with high environmental support and high positive attitude. And of course, the lowest is here, where people have low attitude and they're in a poorer environment. And I think there's about an eight-fold difference, if I remember correctly, between these two groups. But what I also want you to see are these two corners. So neither high environment on its own or high positive attitude on its own does as well. So even when people are in a good environment, 
maybe there's things that we can do as psychologists to help them perhaps even just appreciate the environment that they're in and begin to walk more. So, the first discussion point. The environment is a necessary but not sufficient prerequisite for increasing physical activity. Uh, and Billy Giles Corte concluded that in that article. But walking rates are declining around the world, even in countries like Denmark, where infrastructure is good. But Netherlands seems to be hanging on to their walking levels. So why is this happening? What do you think? If you'd like to stand up, no compulsion, stand up if you'd like to and have two or three minutes discussion about that with your neighbour. Finish that discussion. Well, lots of uh, good discussion happening, and things that I heard were we need to know more about the age breakdown here. I don't think we know that for world level statistics, um, and environments. Uh, need to be safe as well as aesthetically pleasing and so on. So I bet you had some interesting answers to why rates of walking are declining. I didn't hear anyone say the Ford Motor Vehicle Company, but I'm sure that's part of it. Okay, to the persuade bit of the title. Now, intervention evidence is limited. We are at an international conference. We're hearing a lot about intervention efforts, but when we take a systematic review approach to the literature, we find very few environmental interventions. Um, and the reference here is to the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence in the UK, NICE. That's its website. It has an amazing range of resources if you care to look in there. And they issue guidance on how a variety of places, particularly health, should approach things in order to promote health. So they had guidance on how we should change the environment to promote health. And when we reviewed the evidence, I was part of this group, uh, was very few and far between was any level of ed evidence that could be listed as a convincing way forward. Nevertheless, guidance was issued and some recommendations were made about how to change the environment. And sadly the same is true when we look at walking interventions. Um, part of our group, led by David Ogilvy, produced a systematic review in 2007 about how should we promote walking? What does the literature tell us? And again, there's relatively few. I think that would be a bigger database now. But we need more interventions and we don't know the full story of how to change either the environment or walking behaviour. And here I would quite like to 
reassert the role of reaching individuals. Um, and thanks to Jim Salas for this slide that reminds us that there are many aspects of um, changing behaviour, not just the individual level at the foot, but as Jim has to told us over the years, there are these other levels, interpersonal levels, at the organisational level, at the community level, and policy level. Indeed, we need all of them working to have a real shot at changing population health. But as I review things over the past five years, perhaps, we've been so busy learning that perhaps the individual level isn't the only place to work. We've almost forgotten to work there. And so I want to reassert the role of trying to change behaviour at the individual level, providing that what we do could actually reach large numbers of people. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next part here. So I'm hoping to sort of re-engage us with not suggesting that the individual level can't work. It can, providing we do the interventions in a way that have the potential to reach large numbers of the population. Now, many places have tried that already, and we've got good examples. And thanks to Wendy for her slides about 10,000 Steps Rockhampton, which many of you might know about, um, a very large community-based uh, opportunity with a multi-strategy health promotion programme where the community was invited by the use of pedometers and a variety of resources to try and reach the 10,000 step target. Now there was uh, varying levels of success. Um, Wendy and her colleagues, many of them will be in the conference, could tell you more about it. It might look as if in some senses the 10,000 steps stemmed that decrease in walking behaviour that we're seeing. It might have increased steps for women. It might have been more successful in Belgium and when they tried it there. But nevertheless, it's a very good example of how to reach at the individual level, but out into the community. And the dissemination is working very well. People can get the resources from the website and look at all the potential uh, people that could be involved in increasing their step count this way. So this is a good example of, of what I'm meaning. Now in the meantime, I think we've had some under advances in our understanding of behaviour change for physical activity. Now we all know that interventions should be theory based. That's been well established by systematic review. And examples of those theories include social cognitive theory, the trans theoretical model, the theory of planned behaviour, the health action model, self-determination theory, nudge theory, a new kind of economic theory, particularly uh, adopted by the UK government at the moment. Um, and the list could go on. I bet you have another theory that you've been working with that I haven't listed. And which theory is best? Well, that's a really good question. And it's a very, very difficult question to answer. Very often, my own opinion is that psychologists use the theory that they know best or, or like best. And so the choice of theory is not really driven by data or evidence. It's more about fashion. Um, and so it's a tricky problem to work out what theory you're going to use to base your intervention on. But coming along to our help in this regard was a series of, of papers and some thinking by UK colleagues uh, Abrahams and Michi about what kind of techniques work not the theories themselves, but can we extract from the theories the actual things that people use to help people change behaviour, the actual techniques, what do you do with someone, what resources do you give them, how do you help them. This creates a bit of advance in our thinking. And a systematic review of the various techniques used in interventions uh, was done by Michi and her colleagues in 2009. <coughs> Lots of evaluations in there with lots of people and at the end of that they concluded that self-monitoring with at least one other technique from control theory like intention formation were more effective than other interventions and these are the effect size differences in the brackets at the end of that sentence. So 
So quite a lot of difference. So self-monitoring is checking that behaviour for yourself. A set of weighing scales is a good example of self-monitoring if you're trying to change your weight. You can monitor your own progress. And intention formation is making a plan, an action plan in some theoretical descriptions or goal setting in, in other theoretical descriptions. You're intending to do something. So these seem critical um, from the systematic review evidence. And in our group, we've been taking that on a step further by actually trying to look at these behaviour change techniques in relation to walking and cycling, whereas Miki's work was physical activity in general and eating behaviour. And so we've been doing a review of, of the literature with relation to walking and cycling, and we've got presentations by Emma Bird and Graham Baker at the conference giving a little bit more detail about that review. But again, we found in reviewing the literature more specifically for walking and cycling, self-monitoring and intention formation are the most common techniques in the interventions that seem to report a statistical change in walking and cycling. So those two techniques now give us a real clue about how we should go forward. And it, it almost, they, they could come from a variety of different theories. You, you'll be able to see that yourself. Several theories would point us towards doing self-monitoring and intention formation, but these are the actual techniques that work. So in terms of walking, the pedometer, of course, offers a very perfect self-monitoring tool. You see what's going on on a daily basis or a weekly basis, some people like that, and it works also for intention formation because you can set a goal to achieve on a daily or weekly basis and measure your progress towards it very easily. So we have a perfect tool that uses the behaviour change techniques that are said to work the best. So this gives us another clue about a way to go forward. So now I think interventions not need only have theory, they must also have the behaviour change techniques that work in them as well. And this is a new way forward. And when we are developing our interventions, we use this uh, framework from the Medical Research Council, and this was published in the BMJ in 2008, in which you, you go through a cycle of how to develop an intervention that could eventually be implemented. And for our walking programmes, we started at the development side with the systematic review by David Ogilvy. We then went on to feasibility and piloting because the, the review said the pedometers offer a potential way forward. We didn't have the information about behaviour change techniques at that point when we started. We started working with different ways of using pedometers over different lengths of time uh, and using different goals for people to help them change. And we eventually worked out what we thought was the best bet and evaluated that in a bigger program. And we have several publications from that evaluation part. And now we're at the implementation part, and I've heard other people describe it from perhaps other frameworks that they work from to be replication studies or translation studies. So over an evaluation, we found something that worked. We saw that it could work over quite a long period of time. We saw that it was cost effective and now we're trying to implement that. And these different studies are, are what I'll be finishing up in the latter part of the presentation about. So this is our work from Scotland, a systematic review started us off. We then produced what we've described as walking for well-being. It is based on graduated goals with the use of a pedometer and an opportunity to, to have a consultation or a kind of guided discussion with the person. It turns out the consultation may not be the most important part because we showed that it could work in the short term and the 12 month maintenance was not uh, linked to the consultation. We did get behaviour change staying for 12 months but the consultation wasn't perhaps the most important part. The goals and the pedometer were. We also showed this was pretty cost effective and the title of the article was Pedometer's Cost Buttons. So this is a very cheap way for people to consider changing activity. 
We've been implementing it with football, and, and for that I mean soccer fans, with older adults, um, and these two in blue I'm going to talk about in a minute, with people with learning disabilities via web delivery, uh, delivery and in active commuting walk to work studies. Um, over the current uh, period of time, these studies are all ongoing. And so here's the essence of our programme of the graduated goals, and this was a part of work uh, con contributed by the Scottish Physical Activity Research Collaboration. And the idea was that people would get their baseline steps measured. So that's a critical part. Where are you now? And then over the first two weeks, they were invited to think of days of the week, three of them, in which they could add around 1,500 steps to their baseline. And, you know, if pedometers aren't available, that's not so difficult to translate into minutes. It's about 15 minutes on three days of the week. So we're invited to do that intention formation. Where, what days, when will I try and do this 1,500 steps? So they had two weeks to try and build that up. And then in the, the next two weeks, they were invited to increase the frequency of that to five days. So it's the graduated approach that we were working on. Then by weeks five and six, they were invited to think of how they could get 3,000 steps beyond their baseline level still. And this was all written down for them so they didn't have to calculate it each time. Again, on at least three days of the week. And by week seven, that was five days of the week. And of course, if you're arithmetically inclined, you will see that does reach the public health guidelines by uh, week seven. Then their goal for the rest of the, the period of the walking <coughs> programme was to maintain that. So there were some, of course, people didn't like that amount. They, they chose their own amount. But this was the guideline that <coughs> they, we worked our walking programme with. So this is the graduated walking programme. So this is what we're now trying to implement, and, and we're on to the some people part of the title. Where are the men in walking studies? So with review evidence, we can see that um, men do not come forward for walking studies for some reason or the other. In David Ogilvie's study, um, in 29 of the 48, most of the participants were women. In a review by Bravata about the use of pedometers in particular, only 15% of all the participants in that review were male. In a review of recruitment by a Sparkle colleague, Charlie Foster, um, the strategies that were used for recruitment seem to attract more women than men. So, so why are men not coming forward? This was coupled with new concerns particularly in Europe, but perhaps around the world, for men's health in general. And, and this article, again, in the BMJ by White, suggested that men need their own health strategy. There's a growing recognition, too, which we're trying to buy into, that professional sports clubs have the potential to improve men's health. And this website, Healthy Stadia, gives some of that information. So in Scotland, quite like Australia actually, I was interested that this week the Australian Health Survey showed that there was even higher percentage of Australian men uh, overweight or obese. But this is the Scottish data, and you can see, well this is the UK, just in case you didn't know that. Um, this is England. The red part here obviously is Scotland, and we're at the highest level in the UK. So 65% of all adults were overweight or obese, but men were more likely than women to be overweight or obese in Scotland. So a concern, how will we tackle this? And thus was born the idea that we could use football, or as I say, soccer fans, uh, as the potential reach into certainly a group of men, certainly a group of men who would be overweight, but who might be inclined to come forward in this setting when they're not inclined to come forward in other settings. And these are some of the football fans in training, and I'll explain a bit more about that to you. So this was a, a big study uh, 
with various collaborating universities across the top, with the Scottish Premier League Trust and the football pools helping us, entitled football fans in training. And the main question was, can the draw of professional football clubs help Scottish men lose weight and become more active? So the activity part was, was clearly the part that I'm involved with most, um, was a main element of this study. It's led by my colleagues Sally Wake and Kate Hunt from the University of Glasgow. So the football fans in training was um, something that was going to last 12 weeks. It was evidence-based, both in terms of dietary changes and physical activity changes. It was gender sensitized for men, and it was about weight management and healthy lifestyle. It incorporated the walking program that I've described to you, that individualized program, but it also had a training um, session at the football stadia each week because that's where they went for their weekly classes and that was a huge motivational pull. The men loved going along to their home football grounds and they more liked the fact that they were being trained by the football club's coaches. The program was delivered by the community coaches and in the target age range there was 35 to 65 and you can see um, that they had to have a BMI of over 27 to join. And even um, when the study team would go to the stadia and they were completely empty, you could see how appealing that was for people who love football. These stadia, the grass, the hallowed ground, was just so appealing for them to go to and work with the coaches there. The motivational levels in this study are the highest I've ever seen in any physical activity intervention. So this was a feasibility trial um, we started up with. So in August, uh, at the top there, in 2010, we recruited people really only from two clubs in Scotland at the time. We took a whole load of baseline measures. They were randomised into the intervention group who immediately got their 12-week programme. And we followed them for um, a year down here and they had a comparison group but we only held them for 12 weeks then they got the program as well and this was just to give us a true randomization here for the purposes of developing a fuller trial and to allow the men access to the program as quickly as possible these were the components of the program there was a goal of five to ten percent weight loss there was a lot of education about food, portion sizing and balanced diets. There was some education about alcohol awareness. There was discussion about long-term behaviour change. It was definitely not seen as a diet or a slimming club. It was something long-term. Weight loss was discussed and it was seen to be a, a gradual process too. And of course, increased physical activity was encouraged. And there was banter, which I'm not sure if it translates to every language, but it's, it's, it's uh, good crack in, in Irish. It's, uh, I don't know what it is in Australian, but it's, it, it's the men interacting with each other and the, co and the coaches in a very fun way. It wasn't a serious, I'm going to tell you how to change your behaviour. It was all in an interactive and fun environment. So the physical activity goals were related to weight loss. So we used 45 minutes as the target for most days of the week. And that uh, actually comes from a Scottish guideline, the same guidelines. That was our target. And we tried to tailor this for individual ability and fitness levels. And when we were training the coaches in the beginning, they simply couldn't get their head around how unfit these men were going to be. So we were saying, Let, let's have a suggestion of, of where we'll start. Well, we'll start by running around the pitch. No. <laughs> no. We'll start by walking around the pitch. I know what we'll do. We'll have them run up and down the steps of the stadium. No. <laughs> There'll be heart attacks happening. We will walk up and down. You know, so the coaches needed a lot of understanding because they're used to working, of course, with people who are fit and able about what was going to happen when the, these groups of men came along. The physical activity part included the pedometer-based program that I've described as homework and they had that individualised to their own baseline levels 
but they were also encouraged to explore their own community and see what they could find uh, where they lived in terms of gyms or cycling routes or swimming pools. And a lot of them, if they lived in the same locale, could meet up uh, and walk or run together. And every week, the coaches also delivered the physical activity part to the education programme, where they were supposed to be teaching the elements of health-related fitness. Here we see some boxercise going on. So the good thing was that our programme, our feasibility study, showed this could be effective. So you can see in the intervention group, uh, a decrease in, in weight. It's about 4.6% no change in the comparison group. Only two points here because they stopped at 12 weeks, but this group goes on to 12 months. For me, of course, it was exciting to see that physical activity increased. We used the IPAC because in the full study we were going to use large numbers. Uh, that seemed the most appropriate me method. So, oops, sorry. We get increases, but then a little bit of drop to 12 months, but still higher than baseline, no change in comparison. But we've also got decreases in self-reported sitting time, and I'll come back to that at the end um, through the IPAC, with no change in the comparison and a drop in the intervention. I was really interested to find out how the men felt about the pedometer and walking, because so very few men come forward to walking studies. This was an only men opportunity. So what were they thinking about it? Was it useful? And my colleague Kate Hunt uh, did the semi-structured interviews by telephone and discovered that this pedometer was very widely accepted, that they were valued. They were valued for motivation, for self-monitoring, good, because that's a behavior change technique that works, and for goal setting, good, that's intention formation. And they used it very routinely. They adopted it into their lives quickly. So here's some quotations. You'll have to try your Scottish accents out for some of these. Everybody was delighted with the pedometer. Kick up the backside. So the pedometer worked the way it should for self-monitoring. I'm maybe not doing as much as I thought I was doing here, this person is saying. And fortunately, um, the men in the intervention group did record their step counts, and we can see here a significant increase of over 3,000 steps over the 12-week the part of that program. Now, one of the very important parts about this uh, particular program is its reach across the socioeconomic spectrum. And these quintiles here come from, oh dear, wrong thing, the, the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. So this group are the most deprived, this group are the least deprived. Um, I bet you've all been involved in studies where you measured socioeconomic status. I have never been involved in a study there is almost a flat line across the whole population. We almost always see the least deprived are the highest participants and it, you'll get a gradient going down this way and you'll reach very few of the most deprived. So this opportunity to be associated with football um, has a particular reach which is very important. We've now developed a programme across all the Premier League clubs in Scotland uh, you might have visited some of these places. You might know that some of them are no longer in the Premier League. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> but uh, this is our full trial that the feasibility led up to. We've actually just finished the field work. Um, we randomised now. Our target was 360 men from all over Scotland. We, we got more than that. And then the comparison group, the comparison group is now held for the full 12 months before they get training. And we had very good retention at our 12-week measures, unbelievable retention at our 12-month measures. And I think this is something to do with the attraction of the football club. 
And here are some of these uh, pictures of them doing things at their football clubs. They often had small-sided games going on. And this man here, um, any Scottish football aficionados will know he's a legend, Pat Nevin. And the, the men in the club, you know, for the random chance that he might be there one week, <laughs> would come religiously just in case they got the chance to play a game with Pat Nevin, uh, if that was happening. And uh, at this conference, there's more about this study from Craig Donaghy and from Cindy Gray, uh, who's presenting on Saturday, who's pretty well led the whole coordination of this. And you can find out more about that there. So discussion point two, using sports settings for physical activity promotion with the fans maybe has great public health potential and reach. Uh, and walking provided an excellent start point for these men. They enjoyed the pedometer as well. This was very important for me because when our study was being reviewed for the larger funding, a reviewer, whom I don't know, said that my part of the study was a fatal design flaw. And that's not really the sort of thing you want to hear when you're designing a study. The fatal design flaw was that men would never walk. That's not what men want to do. Fortunately, we convinced them to give us the funding anyway, and I think we've shown that they do want to walk, and it's a critical ingredient of them building their physical capacity for other things and to help them lose weight. But why do men not come forward for other walking projects? What do you think of that? Please, again, if you'd like to stand up and discuss that with your neighbour for a couple of minutes. finish that little conversation. So again, a number of uh, interesting points coming forward about what men might perceive about walking. So just like we have in the physical education domain, the idea that perhaps single sex classes are better for girls, here we might be showing that for walking, single sex classes might be better for men in this situation because they might otherwise think walking something that only women do. So, to be continued perhaps. So the final part is that the second some people part of the title, how can we persuade 
more older adults to walk more. And I found in my research for this two very interesting Australian programs. One from Melbourne here, reported from a conference in Hobart, in which they've got a very large uh, cohort study going on in a longitudinal way of people aged 65 plus. And they found, not unsurprisingly, that the average time spent walking decreased as the cohort aged. But they had a number of uh, variables that they were able to measure and use in regression analysis and found that functional status was one of the main predictors of decline in walking. So here we see a kind of negative cycle. So if you lose functional status, you stop walking. And yet, we know that walking promotes the maintenance of function, the ability to stand up and walk independently, and so on. So this is part of a kind of vicious cycle. If you lose status, you stop walking. If you stop walking, you lose more functional status. And so they recommend that walking is promoted for this age group for prevention of loss of functional status. And then one of my favorite papers of all time um, which I wish I had written by uh, Stanaway. I, I don't know if these authors are here, but again, this came from uh, a study in Sydney. Now, this, the British Medical Journal, uh, this article was written in the British Medical Journal's Christmas edition. And some of you may know that that is usually a kind of whimsical take on things, and it's, it's, it's often a, a fun piece of publication. But it has to have good science as well. So these authors had good science. They had 1,700 men who were over 70, and they measured them in a whole lot of different things, including the rate at which they normally walked and they had a five-year follow-up. Now, these men, if they walked at three kilometers an hour, were 1.23 times less likely to die than those who walked slower. Now, three kilometers isn't that fast. This is something we can aspire to. And they said, this must be the Grim Reaper's preferred walking speed. They confessed that they did not have full informed consent from the Grim Reaper, that they could not find him in the Sydney telephone book, but nevertheless, this is what they concluded about that part. Then they established that none of the men that walked at five kilometres an hour or greater had any contact with death. So they said this is the Grim Reaper's maximum speed. And they confessed that they couldn't rule out other ways of avoiding death, such as the youth of the deathly hallows or invisibility cloaks. But they felt that this was guiding people to say that if you can keep walking at three kilometers a mile an hour or more, you can avoid death. So very recommended read. Uh, and this, obviously, the serious point being made is that if we can keep people walking, it's associated with longevity. So then we looked at the Scottish uh, recent statistics, and this is scary. So this is the percentage of our population reporting no 10-minute bouts of walking in the past four weeks, quite a recent year. So adult men, but Worse for those over 65, 65% report no 10 minute walking. Adult women, and the worst, the women over 65, 74% of them report no 10 minute bouts of walking. Some serious things have to be done. Clearly, this older age group could benefit a lot from a 10 minute bout of walking, even once a week, never mind once a day. So we had a study called West End Walkers 65 Plus that was aimed to increase walking in this age group. Our objectives were to, again, in a feasibility design, see if our walking program that I've already described to you with a pedometer could work for older adults. We were using a primary care setting because older adults see their GP or family doctor uh, much more often than younger groups. 
We wanted to use a practice nurse to deliver that intervention, not a trained researcher, so that any practice could do it thereafter. And we wanted this to be an alternative to exercise referral, where the doctor refers their patient off to another third party who does the exercise opportunities for them. Largely because a recent review um, headed by a, a colleague, Paisy, who's not, is he here? I don't know, he's now in Australia, I know, um, that I was involved with, showed very modest effects of these exercise referral schemes um, over the long haul. So we had a, a two-arm randomised control trial with a 12-week follow-up. We worked in one general practice setting. Everyone had to be over 65 to participate. The, the doctor did the screening for us. That was the total number of people in the practice over 65. A lot were screened out. They were too frail or had chronic conditions that, in which they were not able to walk. And then we, ha we invited those into the study. Oops, doing the wrong thing. Um, sort of half and half, positive and negative. 50 attended. And eventually we had quite small numbers randomised from that um, after the screening process. The intervention was a consultation with the practice nurse and the pedometer and walking program that they were given. The control group continued as normal, but then we didn't want to hold them for a long time without anything. They then got the intervention after that, after 12 weeks. So I'm giving you some selected outcomes here, particularly step counts and activity patterns, measured with ActivePal, which is a, a Scottish company. If you haven't visited their stand, you should do so. They haven't paid me to say that at all. It's worn continuously, but you don't get anything back from it. It's not visible feedback you get. So here are results for steps per day. So the intervention group in green, they get the intervention, they increase by around 2,000 steps a day, and they maintain that for the next 12 weeks, which is nice to see. The control group stay as normal for their 12 weeks, then they get the intervention here, and they get the exact same increase. So a nice A, B, A, B design, I think, in psychology, where you get the same result the second time you try it. Now, 2,000 steps isn't as much as we got with adults when we tried this, or, or the football fans, but that's still going to be of benefit to older adults. And these are the walking minutes, the same pattern of results, as you can see, for each of the control uh, uh, the intervention, the control, and the maintenance going on here, 22 minutes a day increase. And interestingly, objectively measured sitting time with the active PAL. So a significant decrease for the intervention group, 48 minutes a day decrease. Strangely, a slight increase whilst the control group are waiting, but when they get the intervention, they decrease also. And that's good because it could be thought and sometimes suggested that when older adults increase their physical activity, they may also, as a compensatory me mechanism, increase their sitting down time. But we're actually showing it decreasing. I think this is something to do with the pedometer's way of helping people change behaviour, because you can accumulate steps in very small amounts, as you know, and this might encourage getting up and down more often. We also had some focus groups here um, with each of the intervention and control groups. The bits to pick out are about how they viewed the pedometer. Walking in a, vacu in a vacuum would be pretty difficult. Uh, yes, it really would. <laughs> when you've got your meter on, you, you try to work a wee bit more, you get a bit better. So, there, there's there's self-monitoring happening. You march up and down until you get your target when you when you can self-monitor. So a lot of support for the pedometer, but more mixed support for the booklet where they wrote their goals. This would be their target. They could write things in, standard logging procedures that we all know about. 
we've published this now in the Journal of Family Practice. So some people liked it a lot. I'm logging it everywhere, I'm on the computer, I'm so doing it. And we know those kind of people that like that approach. Other people didn't like it. I don't like that being confined, but somehow it still helped them. I didn't want to do it, but I better do it. Other people hated this. It was setting me up for failure. So we've got to be aware that all of these resources do not appeal to everyone. The pedometer itself won't appeal to everyone, but it seems to have more universal support. So coming to the end of it now, conclusions and some future directions. It is possible to persuade men and older adults to walk more, even though they're elements of the population that might seem that they're least likely to want to come forward for walking programs and their rates of walking are declining. Pedometers and graduated programs seem to be key and such programs may also reduce sitting time. So this is a new area that we're all investigating about whether our physical activity promotion can also decrease sitting time. And I think when using pedometers, it really has the chance to do that. Uh, and uh, that may not be true for all physical activity programs. And walking should be considered as a preventative opportunity for older adults to maintain that functionality so that they can avoid the grim reaper a bit more. Primary care is a good setting. The potential population reach there is good. And of course, we need now larger trials from the one we've suggested. And, and there may be many of those going on around the world. But using sports settings for physical activity promotion is, is a newer idea. That, and that has great public health potential. And we could try that with other sports, all the other kinds of football there are, American, Australian and rugby football, uh, and, and other sports of course as well. And other parts of the fan base, so maybe not just the men. And some of my colleagues at Edinburgh are now exploring this with mothers and daughters who are in the fan base for clubs as well. So points for further discussion. We need more creative ideas about how to reach parts of the population um, and arrive at the Netherlands way where walking and cycling are normal and everyone does them. Yes, the environment's important, but we can't wait till that environment's created. We still need to work at the individual level to prompt people to use the environment they have. And hopefully over time, those environments will improve and sustain activity levels. And the discussion point to finish with and leave you to think about do you have other examples that we can learn for, from here about how to intervene with individuals that can have the potential reach out to the whole population? So a sunny thank you for listening this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>